All right, thank you so much for joining. So we have all of our uh, panelists and I can see that we continue to have a few more um, attendees dialing in, but it's a couple minutes after four, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Ann Marburger, I'm the Executive Director of Padres Pedal the Cause. Um, and we are really excited to have leaders from UC San Diego with us um, this afternoon. I know it's certainly an unprecedented time right now and, and frightening on many levels, but I think it's, it's human connections and opportunities to have touch points like today that uh, make us feel connected and remind us that we are part of an amazing community um, of brilliant and passionate leaders who are really helping us respond and navigate through what is somewhat of a frightening time. So um, our goal today is just to provide an opportunity Padres pedal um, community members and friends to hear directly from UC San Diego leadership on what the response uh, to COVID-19 has been like over the past several months. Uh, we'll do we'll hear from Patty on that topic and then we're going to shift um, to Dr. Jameson and Dr. Coffey to understand how that's directly impacting patient care um, and, pa and, and cancer research at the cancer center. So um, what we're going to do is I'll introduce each of the panelists in just a minute and we'll hear directly from each person and then we will um, do about 15 or 20 minutes for Q&A at the end so that everyone who's listening can um, submit their questions. Um, before that, I just have a, a minute or two of housekeeping. So um, all participants besides the panelists have been muted. Um, so don't try and uh, to interrupt via um, voice. If you have a question or a comment, just go ahead and send that through the, the chat in the Q&A. Um, the session is being recorded, and so if any of your friends and family miss it, you can share it. Uh, we do have staff members who are monitoring the chat, and so here's just a visual. The chat room, if you're having any technological issues, we will try and solve those. Um, you can enter those in the chat room, and then as your questions arise throughout the conversation, just go ahead and submit those to me as soon as you have a question. Um, we will field those questions at the end of the presentation. So um, with that, just the last thing is, uh, we're gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. So um, Patty Maysant is the CEO of the UC San Diego Health System. Um, she is running a 9,000 employee operation uh, that has a $2 billion annual operating budget and has been busy responding to COVID-19. I think Patty, since, um, since late January when it first uh, emerged in San Diego. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, and then after Patty, we will hear from Dr. Kat Jameson, who's the Deputy Director of Moore's Cancer Center, and who's a professor of medicine focusing on hematology, um, and also a, a Padres Pedal funded researcher and champion. So thanks for being with us, Kat. Thanks, hey, Sam. And then lastly, we'll, we will hear from Dr. Charlie Coffey, who is a head and neck cancer specialist, and also a big champion of Padres Pedal the Cause. So um, again, thank you all for being with us. Um, we have about 50 people who are listening to us this afternoon, and just to provide some context for the panelists, um, included in our community is actually people who are undergoing cancer treatment right now at Morris Cancer Center. Um, we also have loved ones and family members who are trying to understand what the implications are of COVID-19 and how they can best support cancer patients um, and friends at this time. And then certainly everyone is deeply interested in what's going on with COVID-19 and, and what the outlook is. So. Um, Patty, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you've been leading this response in San Diego um, for the past several months, and the landscape uh, has changed a lot and is, is changing consistently. Can you tell us about um, how things looked in the beginning and, and what's going on now? Sure, sure. And, and I just want to thank everybody for, for calling in. Um, I, was, I was walking, uh, you know, everybody gets their, their walk outside uh, break every so often and I was walking in with my daughter in Encinitas on Sunday and, and walked past a big pedal pedal sign. So uh, even though we're we're in this really restricted time, I see the 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 pedal pedal signs around town and you know I'm just so grateful for uh, for the support that pedal gives to gives to us and to our cancer community and to our researchers. So um, just jumping into the COVID situation, we're you know at, at about 100 days now that we've been managing um, this pandemic. Uh, it started early with the first couple of planes that came from Wuhan to Miramar, and we took care of the first couple of patients in San Diego um, from from those flights. Um, I think it was really a blessing to to be able to do that because, and we we you know there were process issues and things that, you know, that we changed over time, but we got to um, set up a big infrastructure early on to manage COVID patients. So we, 
you know, we were able to get a little bit ahead of the game. We, we really got um, testing up uh, quickly um, once the FDA uh, allowed academic medical centers to stand up testing for um, what we call PCR testing or the testing for the virus. Um, so um, we were able to get that up and operational quickly. We were able to, you know, in the very beginning, you hear a lot about PPE, the personalized, you know, the personal um, protection equipment. And early on, probably in the first week, um, we had a lot of the masks, the N95s that we talk about, you know, disappearing out our door. And, you know, we learned how to lock it down and to work our supply chains so that we had a pretty good inventory of PPE. And, and that's important because obviously that's the way that we keep our staff and our other patients safe. Um, so since that time, um, you know, we've, we've managed uh, against uh, the epidemiology curve. So we have some brilliant scientists um, on campus who, um, once a week, I meet with them and we go through where we think this, the virus is going and we watch the epidemiological epidemi, uh, curves and we, um, you know, and we uh, look at all the different models and, and you know, originally that, um, that model um, got re revised to, to show that we thought that the peak of the virus, this first peak would be in, in mid-April. And so, Sure enough, around mid-April, we were we had about 30 patients in-house and uh, 30 COVID positive patients in-house. Um, the state had asked us to, uh, asked every healthcare system, um, actually across the nation to create capacity for COVID patients. So um, everybody stopped elective surgeries and procedures and clinics. So uh, uh, the engine of the health system really had to shut down to create that capacity. So. Um, we eventually had about uh, 30 patients in-house. Um, kind of thought we were at the at the peak. It started dripping down again to you know 28, 26. Um, bounced around there for a while, and um, frankly, all of a sudden we're seeing another another um, pickup in volume. So right now in-house we have, in the last 48 hours, we've gone from 30 to 37, and so we're watching this very carefully. Um, it's a it's a mixture of uh, growth. We're seeing some from skilled nursing facilities, and I know everybody is very concerned about. I am about my parents in a you know in a, a senior living environment. Um, there are about 66 different independent outbreaks in skilled nursing facilities in San Diego right now, and so um, we've been in the position to start helping the county to test. Um, seniors in their senior facilities and to get a handle on what's happening, but um, we are seeing some inflow of inpatients from skilled nursing faci facilities. Um, we also continue to see patients from San Diego. Um, so um, the social distancing's really, really worked and the volume that we expected is much less, which is fantastic, um, but we are beginning to see it tick up just over the course of the last week. Mm -hmm. um, and then the big, the big trouble that trouble spot, um, frankly, the big hot zone is, is Tijuana. And, um, and so there's a lot going on across the border. And what we're trying to do, um, and so we're seeing patients as well as Scripps and Sharp Chula Vista in particular, they, they're getting a, a big inflow from Mexicali to our affiliate El Centro in Imperial County, seeing a big influx of patients. And um, honestly, it's, it's a really big mess. It's a, it's a humanitarian crisis in Tijuana. The hospitals are full. Um, the physicians are sick or old and not able to, to do the care. Um, there's not enough PPE. Um, there's still 65,000 people a day crossing the border. There's no screening, there's no testing. Um, and so that's, that's the area that we're probably most concerned about in terms of watching um, the evolution of the virus here in San Diego. We're doing a lot as UC San Diego to support that. We've got physicians um, going down and helping with ventilator management and telehealth and critical care support and trying to get PPE down there, but um, and then trying to do some things on this side of the border too. So UC San Diego, I'm I'm proud to say, is leading an effort, you know, to to try to help mitigate some of it, but it's but it's a big issue and we're watching it really closely. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we have started resuming our services. Um, so what happened, you know, a lot of 
a lot of patients stayed away from um, getting healthcare. And um, that worked okay for three weeks. Um, you know, we could postpone things for three or four weeks, but as you all know, you can't postpone cancer care. You can't. Um, and so the idea that we can push this stuff off, you know, in, 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 uh, you know for, for a long period of time just doesn't work. So the, the way that we've tried to create this, a safe environment in our health system so that we can bring people back in for care is by, is by testing. So we've tested our healthcare workers um, we're the only ones in the region that have done this. And we have tested um, over 3,000 healthcare workers, including the healthcare workers at Moore's Cancer Center. Um, and of the 3,500 that we've tested so far, only one actually had the virus. So it's very, 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 very small. Um, we're also testing patients. So if, if you're coming in for a surgery, a procedure, you know, infusion, we're trying to test all the patients so that, again, if you think about Moore's Cancer Center, which I know you all do, um, how can we cre create a, a sense that it's a, as safe as we can possibly make it, that patients are tested, that our workers are tested, our researchers are tested, um, and then we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and keep people tested so that um, as people come in for care that, again, it's as safe as it possibly can be. Um, what we don't want to see, and we have seen it, is, is, for instance, cancer patients not coming in for care. We actually, although the cancer volume has stayed relatively stable, and Matthew can talk about that, um, we are seeing cancer patients not coming in for treatment, and that's just, for me, that's just not okay. So um, we're just trying to get the word out to the community that it's safe to come in, that we're taking every precaution possible, our masking policy works, you know, we're testing, et cetera. So, I'll stop there. That gives you a pretty good broad overview of what's going on. It's it's been a real journey, but um, again, can't tell you how much I appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much, Patty. We're we're really grateful to have you here with us today and to be under your leadership. I mean, this is uh, such a complex challenge. I, when you were talking about some of the border issues, I couldn't help but think about even just the policy implications of the state response and the federal response on how that impacts what's already a hugely complex medical challenge. Um, I just had a question around, it seems like a lot of the, the webinars that I've um, been participating in talk about a three-pronged approach to COVID-19, uh, which is increasing testing, working on a vaccine so future people are prevented from getting it, and then uh, discovering new medicines and rediscovering medicines that could be used to treat COVID-19. Could you touch on, you talked a little bit about sure. testing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in terms of, it's really testing and tracing, and, and so we're also working with our School of Public public health leadership to really stand up an army of um, tracers who can um, trace contacts um, once, a, once a virus is identified in an individual. So that's one piece. Um, in terms of um, the, the vaccine and new, new drugs, um, you know, we were one of the very first um, to, to use Redesivir, um, which um, we used actually one of the first patients that came from Wuhan. It seemed to have a good effect, and um, as people know now, it's it's had it's had a moderate effect. So um, it's it's very um, actually unfortunately difficult to get our hands on now because it's um, become standard of care. But it, it's only it's only moderately um, helpful, and there's we're opening up clinical trials, you know, across a multitude of different um, treatment modalities right now here at UC um, San Diego as, as is happening across the country. Um, and, and in terms of the vaccine, you know, again, and you have people on this phone call that are way smarter than me about these kinds of issues, including Dr. Jameson. But in terms of the vaccine, what my layman's um, view of it is, um, we're, we're not probably going to have a, a meaningful uh, vaccine for at least 18 months. So as I think about what the impact's going to be across the system and the region. Um, I just try to encourage people to get their heads around the fact that, you know, things are not going to be the same and they're not going to go back to pre-COVID days for, you know, at least 18 months. And that's a hard message for people, but it's a, it's kind of a true message. So, you know, again, to be honest and candid about it, I think we have to gear up accordingly. But again, I know Dr. Jameson will have some other comments about it probably. Okay. Um, great. Well, I just wanted to clarify one thing too. I mean, you said that you've tested over 3,000, I believe, uh, yes. 
is in the health system and only one person that has had it. And that's, I mean, people- One person tested positive. That means they had it then at that time that they were tested. Okay, and, and that's even factoring in um, frontline workers who treat COVID patients for days and weeks that are not getting it. So exactly, they were, they were the frontline workers in the emergency department, in the COVID ward, in the ICU. I mean, the most, the potentially most exposed at, um, healthcare workers. And so what that, so what, yeah, so that made us just feel comfortable that even the one that had it, who was masked and the patient was masked, people didn't get it. So I think, again, the most important thing as people come into our environment is this double masking, that the, the provider's wearing a mask and this patient is wearing a mask um, is really, really important. Thank you um, very much. Just in the interest of time, we're gonna, we're gonna transition over to Dr. Jameson to talk about um, what's been happening at the cancer center and what modifications you all have had to put in place there in order to continue to try and, and treat cancer patients during this time. Well, fortunately, because um, our director, Scott Lippman and uh, Patty Mason, Matthew Janusaita, Shreya Kenodia, and I, and Ezra Cohen, Joe Califano, um, Sylvia Gutkite, we have a really great team that get together every Friday to talk about cancer center issues. Um, this, we had a SWAT team in place to be able to deal with this for the cancer center. And we, we consider all aspects, standard clinical care, um, clinical trials, and then uh, the delivery of uh, discoveries like those that Charlie Coffey makes in his translational research um, directly to the clinic. So we had to keep those three things going. And Patty, um, fortunately, put a very robust infrastructure in place, first and foremost, to protect patients who are particularly vul vulnerable because they have cancer, so the immune systems may not work that well. So we were really ahead of the game in terms of being able to um, keep up what we were normally doing because we know that cancer doesn't stop for COVID-19. Uh, we knew that people had to get in. AJ Munt um, was ex very resourceful and, um, you know, the number of people coming in for the radiation therapy didn't change very much. You know, their volumes didn't drop very much. Similarly, in the uh, infusion center, we managed to maintain people coming in there because of this a very good system of having people checking for symptoms and um, you know we have the capacity to socially distance here. Um, Patty was very quick at getting us masks. We also live in the land of biotech so I was really happy a few weeks ago when I was on call down at Hillcrest to watch a truck um, pull away that had clearly just dropped off quite a few masks and PPE. Um, it was a huge relief. Uh, so I think we have a community that tends to stick together and that's what Padre's Pedal helps us do. And it's really galvanized our resolve to continue with our research mission so that we're not just sitting ducks here. We have to be able to find answers to treat COVID-19. Certainly, Patty's made it safe for our patients to be here and us as faculty members. So we're extraordinarily grateful, Patty, as physicians to be able to work in a very safe environment. Uh, you know, I feel like I can do even more than business as usual because one of the, the good things, believe it or not, uh, that's come from this is I now have an app on my phone that I probably would have been reluctant to use before, but, you know, necessity is the mother or father of invention, and it recognizes my face, unfortunately, for this poor app, and I can see everything about my patients. My clinic schedule yesterday was packed. Um, people are finding they can access our health system a little bit more easily, actually, and we're learning to be more adaptable as physicians. And then as scientists, uh, we feel a strong sense of purpose now. So I'm in the lab right now because of a Padres Pedal funded grant uh, that led to a discovery that now uh, we're really hoping to get through the next stage before going to a clinical trial for children with leukemia. And that's something we couldn't have foreseen, but the people in the lab are so excited that we're working in shifts um, to try and get that work finished because again, cancer doesn't stop for COVID and in kids, they don't have many treatment options with leukemia. So I think the key has been testing and making sure that we know who's likely to have been positive. But then beyond that, what do you do if you're positive? What are you gonna do about it? How do you get treated? What kind of access do you have to therapies? Um, so we know that some people respond um, to uh, medication as an outpatient, but unfortunately most people get pretty sick and they end up on our inpatient side. So we've got a very good clinical trials unit uh, that Patty's been supporting for a long time and Matthew has helped to um, reorganize together with Shreya. And so some of the things we discovered for cancer 
are actually coming to the fore now to treat COVID-19. So for example, we have a cellular therapy, cell and regenerative medicine service, where we give um, therapies that can induce this, what's called a cytokine storm. And that is driven primarily by something called IL-6, which I know sounds technical, but it's exactly the same thing that COVID-19 does. So because we built a pretty advanced immunotherapy program with Ezra Cohen, Dan Kaufman, a number of us doing that, we already knew how to deal with this cytokine storm. And it's a drug called tocilizumab, TOSI for short, it blocks IL-6. So we were one of the first centers to start using it in our ICU together with the antiviral remdesivir. And because um, Patty um, agreed, Patty Mason agreed to get the, the first couple of patients with COVID, we had experience with remdesivir in our ICU very early on, so we knew it had some activity. Um, but with our robust clinical trials infrastructure, we can do these combination studies. So basically, um, not only can we treat people early in the course of disease, we can treat them really late in the course of disease. And um, you know, even people who have advanced lung injury, um, we're looking at some cellular therapy protocols that may help to repair that lung injury. So I think because we have experience with diagnostics and therapeutics and working as teams, we're able to come through with um, you know, really tractable treatment strategies for those people that find themselves infected. Uh, the other thing is there are anti-seria, so these antibodies we make, against the virus. And some people are just better at doing it than others. So there's a big grant um, to identify those people that make the best neutralizing antibodies within California through the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. We're part of that. And basically then they'll find the antibodies that are really very specific and then grow them up in bats. So some of us may be able to get passive immunity if we're sick or be donors if we've been exposed to it and got better. So that looks like a, a very, very effective approach. So even though we may not have a vaccine for 18 months, and some of those vaccines have been made locally targeting DNA or RNA, I think we'll have mitigation strategies in the interim. And certainly we wanna make sure that people know we're open for business. Um, we've been doing clinical trials, we never stopped. Uh, you know, we really rely on being able to provide the most up-to-date patient care and to work again as a SWAT team to make sure that cancer doesn't rear its ugly head and that we stamp it out before it gets a chance. And that's what's so important about what Patty's put in place here, that we can continue to do that. Um, thanks, Kat. I think, um, so it, it's great to hear that many of the services are, are continuing and that we, we all know that we can't take a break when it comes to cancer care. Um, I want to get to talking about funding for research. And I think obviously that's Padre's Petals bread and butter and our mission and it's a perception that either um, funds could decrease um, because funding is shifting to be focused on COVID-19 uh, and or because the economic situation has worsened. And so um, what are you seeing in terms of funding for cancer research in clinical trials? Well, I think that funding for basic cancer research is about the same. It hasn't gone down, but funding for translational or clinical trials research is going to be hit the hardest. And that's really unfortunate because that's where we can make a huge difference here um, in terms of being able to develop new therapies based on the teams we have here, we have an incredible campus where we can really draw on uh, bioengineering and you know all the institutes around us to develop new discoveries to, to get to the clinic very quickly. We've got a couple of FDA approvals. We didn't even think about that. That's just what we do. That's the biggest, most hardest hit piece, investigator initiated trials and that research where we take the basic science discovery to the clinic um, is going to take all the the um, energy that uh, you and your team can muster. And because this is where I think it's gonna be the hardest to get funded. And it's so unfortunate because we live in the land of biotech. We live in the land where we can make new therapies, but it, it's hard to get funded for that right now. Um, people are being careful with their um, philanthropic portfolios because a lot of them have funds that, you know, they were invested in the stock market and they're worth a third less than they were. And so they're becoming a bit risk averse. And that's unfortunate because, you know, we can translate discoveries really quickly and did actually with a, a pedal grant, we took an antibody called Sermtuzumab and we used it for women with breast cancer who are doing well um, as a result of that pedal funded study. And, you know, we want to expand that uh, but companies are saying, wait a minute, we can only pay for what we said we would do now. 
we can't do anything more. So I think we're in this restrictive funding time for what's called translational research, where we take a discovery and get it to the clinic and for the early phase clinical studies. And that's, that's gonna be an issue. So we really need to galvanize or resolve to um, strengthen the funding mechanisms for that. I think a lot of people are interested, but I think we just have to get on and do it. Yeah. Well, I think the, the good news is that the, the money that we raised last year um, through Padres Pedal is still being applied and we're just in the final stages of selecting grant recipients from um, the funding. And I know a couple of those will be clinical trials and um, also some team science awards. So it'll be a, a nice opportunity for the Padres Pedal community to see ex exactly where that funding is hitting the road. Um, Kat, I want to just go one other way. Uh, this morning I was on a webinar um, with some different leaders from San Diego um, for industry and research, and you alluded to this uh, bioscience mecca that we live in, and a researcher from Sanford, Burnham Previs, was talking about how they've screened 30 different drugs um, to see if they could reapply those to treat COVID-19. Are, are you up on that, and are you comfortable? Oh, absolutely. So Sumit Chanda, C-H-A-N-D-A, I've got to do a shout out to Sumit Chanda. He's a phenomenal researcher at Sanford, Burnham Previs. He has a biosafety level three facility that he was just about to shut down. And uh, Christina Viore, who runs the Sanford Burnham Prep, said, ah, let's keep it going just in case. We'll have it for when the day comes. Well, the day came. And suddenly Samit got very busy. Um, he's a phenomenal investigator, but also a collaborator. Um, so he's repurposing drugs. He's also looking for new drugs that work to block viral replication from SARS-CoV-2, which is the real name of the virus. Um, I dropped a drug for his team off on Monday afternoon and Pierre from his lab met me outside. Uh, the drug is called Fedratinib. We've uh, developed it at the cancer center with a local company and it looks like the virus actually goes in, signals through JAK2 to activate its entry into the cell. So he's testing that directly in his system and said, oh, I'll have results for you by the end of next week. Uh, so that's the extraordinary rapidity with which people can do things. Um, BMS is already hoping to start a clinical trial here with that drug to reduce the cytokine storm before people end up having to go to the ICU. So basically trying to mitigate that. Um, but that's how adaptable people are here. And then we've got Rob Knight, um, who has a microbiome center and says, well, who are the people we really should be targeting with some of these strategies and trying to predict that? Um, so Sumit Chanda has done a great job. We've also got the Hoya Institute of Allergy and Immunology with Mitch Cronenberg and other investigators mm -hmm. there who are well-funded to do work on COVID-19 mitigation strategies until we have a vaccine, as Patty was alluding to. So I think our population here is going to be in better shape because of efforts um, that um, are really driven by this collective responsibility to you know look fear in the face and say this isn't going to get us and that's where um, pedal comes in mm -hmm. and, and um, we don't have to do everything COVID. we have to keep doing cancer research kat i know i was going to save specific questions for the end but i have a, a specific one that came up on this topic and uh, dr coffee we're coming for you next um any comments on using imbruvica for covid 19 cytokine storm at uc san diego yeah you know there are a number of um molecules, small molecules. They're usually pills. Um, tocilizumab is an IL-6 inhibitor, and that's actually a, an injection um, or IV administration. But Imbruvica, or Ibrutinib, as it's known, uh, blocks B cells. Um, and so, yeah, you could reduce some of the growth factors that are released by B cells, but you wouldn't want to do that um, too strongly because we need our B cells are, as part of the response to make antibodies that block the virus. So what we're challenged with now as we develop clinical trials for this disease, COVID-19, coronavirus, infectious disease as in 2019, when we moved on between 2019 now and into 2020, um, is we're trying to figure out at what stage do you give these medications? You know, do you give something early to block the cytokine storm or is that going to block the immune response against the virus? And I think as we start to understand more about how the virus um, replicates or in other words, words um, makes more of itself, we're going to know the right staging. I think Imbruvica uh, would be a later stage. It's a pill, uh, but it would be okay. something you'd see. You'd give only if somebody hadn't had a good response to that drug I mentioned, tocilizumab. And then we would move on to a cellular therapy because we have a cellular therapy team here. So not many places have a cellular therapy service. We have it. 
Um, you know, PEDAL has helped us to do some really important clinical trials um, that span the spectrum from immunotherapy, cancer stem cell targeting, uh, precision medicine and community outreach and engagement. And we're including all four pillars of those research plans um, from the Cancer Center under the, the umbrella of PEDAL and uh, being able to move forward on all four fronts. And as Patty mentioned, uh, the biggest source of COVID in the community is coming from the South. And we have to be able to provide these therapies regardless of your paycheck. You know, and that's something I'm very proud that our system has managed to do for a long time. And I'm glad that we can continue to do it. Thanks, Kat. Uh, Dr. Coffey, um, I would like to introduce you and, and turn the floor over to you. Um, I'll add that Dr. Coffey uh, is married to an ER doctor that's also in the UC San Diego health system. So um, the question, feel free to, to wrap in some anecdotes you've learned through Christiane. Um, but the question for you is really just understanding um, how has COVID-19 impacted delivery of care and service for head and neck cancer um, patients that you treat? And I think really the interest here is um, understanding so we can really empathize what it's like for patients to go through these treatments and how we can best support our friends and family members who are going through this. Certainly. Thanks, Anne. And I'll say first, I'm glad the last question on cytokine storm went to Dr. Jameson and not to me. Um, you know, I, I was reflecting recently, it's in kind of a paradoxical way, it, the cancer center and cancer providers, cancer patients are, are fairly well suited to this period. And, and it's strange, but, you know, when you think about it, when you go to the grocery store, you don't expect that to be hard, right? But, the, but now it is. You show up and you got to wear a mask and you got to go certain times a day. You expect cancer treatment to be hard. Um, and that's what is the norm for us. And, and so... You know, patients come in scared um, and always have, right? When, when you get a cancer diagnosis or your family gets a cancer diagnosis, that's overwhelming uh, in, in many cases. And so even though this is a scary time that we're all living in right now at the moment, it, it doesn't, I won't say it doesn't change, but, um, but it's not totally new for cancer patients and for cancer providers. This is something that we're used to dealing with and being able to support patients and support families going through some of the most difficult times in our lives. And so in that sense, you know, my, my day-to-day -day interaction with patients and the care we've, we've been able to continue to provide, you know, really hasn't changed. Yes, patients come in overwhelmed, but, but in a weird sort of way, it's irrespective to all of the, you know, the tumultuous times that we're living in and all of the, the fear related to coronavirus. And that doesn't, you know, detract from all the additional anxieties that, that are on top of that, but, but simply to say that it's not like we're having to start from scratch to figure out how to do hard things because it's, it's what we do every day. Um, and then along, you know, similar lines, Dr. Jamison talked to the importance and the value of being able to leverage understanding of some of the technical science to treating patients, treating coronavirus and, and patients, who have cancer diagnosis and potentially coronavirus as well, you know, similarly, the, you know, adaptability that's required in this time is not new for cancer care, right? Or medicine in general, if you're not adaptable, if you're not flexible, um, as new developments arise, new research emerges, then you're, you're not going to succeed in being able to take care of cancer patients. And so that also, I think, puts those of us at the cancer center and in the oncology world in a, if not entirely unique, at least, at least a, a good position to be able to adapt in real time to providing the care that's needed and, and being creative when it's required. So for instance, all of us have um, shifted in large part to using telehealth to be able to provide care that our patients need, even if they're not able to be here on site in real time for some very important reasons, right? Obviously many of our cancer patients, including head and neck cancer patients, bone marrow transplant patients, so many patients undergoing active chemotherapy or post-therapy are immunosuppressed. So going into any crowded environment, much less a healthcare environment, can be scary. Um, and there are certainly times and, and plenty of opportunities and, and instances in, in what I do that there's no substitute. We have to be able to examine a patient and, and you know, do a lot of things in person. But on the other hand, there, there's plenty that we can do without that. Um, and the technology is not new. I mean, there is plenty of new interactive uh, web-based technology we're all experiencing with, but, but frankly, it's not really the high-tech side of things. So it's amazing to all of us, and certainly to me, what we're able to accomplish and to do 
uh, via remote formats and being able to talk to patients online and discuss diagnosis and discuss treatment plans and, and not as a substitute for being able to provide some of the critical in-person care, but as a way to augment that and to provide patients some support as they go through treatment and post-op recovery, et cetera, without having to have them exposed to, you know, additional risk perceived or, or otherwise. And so I think that's a place that I've seen my practice change. And, and honestly, I think for the better, and I hope something that our patients are, are appreciating and that we'll also be able to carry forward, even as we finally move out of this, it's, it seemed like an eternity so far. Patty mentioned a hundred days. It I'm sure feels like years to many of us, but, but somewhere in the future, all right, we're, we're all going to be out of this. And I think we're going to be able to take some very important lessons learned in terms of effective and efficient patient care and, and move that, you know, into the, the next era. Great. Um, and, and you guys are certainly well trained, like you said, and adapted, which adaptable, which we, we are very grateful for. Um, I have a, a higher level question that's come in um, and it's about the fact that uh, Patty alluded to that we haven't hit a peak yet. We thought we were peaking in April and then the numbers are trickling in. Um, does she see, and do you all collectively foresee um, continued increase with California reopening and the significant ca cases in Tijuana, how does that um, impact our, our opening and our ability to start engaging socially? Do any of you uh, feel comfortable commenting on that? Matthew, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll continue to reopen, but in a very measured way. Um, you know, I don't think that we are going to stop social distancing for a while. I don't think we're going to stop masking for a while. Um, I just think this needs to become a, a normal part of everyday life for us for the next six months to a year um, in order to maintain a certain level of, uh, of kind of COVID activity until we start to build up a vaccine and, and herd immunity. And that's going to take, uh, you know, that's going to take 18 months. Um, so we'll continue to manage it slowly. We'll start reopening things, but in a very mm -hmm. good way. Yeah, I think in, um, to Matthew's point about, you know, going slow here, something that, that Patty mentioned uh, earlier was the importance of, of getting the care that you need when you need it. So even though there's a ton of uncertainty, and, and frankly, I don't think any of us have the right answer of how to manage, you know, return to work, return to normalcy, um, we do want to underscore the fact that there are a lot of things, especially regarding cancer care and our medical health in general, that, that can't wait and shouldn't wait. So even as we're all trying to, to come to terms with the uncertainty of, well, you know, when is it safe for my kid to go back to school? When is it safe for me to go to a, you know, a, a dinner with friends? You know, the reality is one thing that should, I think, stay in the forefront of people's minds is that if you need medical care, you should seek it. You shouldn't delay. You know, you, you may not need to go on that vacation next month. I hope you can, um, but, but certainly if you're having chest pain, certainly if you've got a new neck mass, if you've got something that seems wrong and that seems like it's going to require evaluation and care, that really can't and shouldn't wait, and, and we're in a good position now to be able to provide that care in a timely fashion. And to underscore what Dr. Confi and, uh, and Matthew were saying, I think it's very important for people who have an established diagnosis of cancer to know that we're here, we're definitely available to um, treat you, don't put it off. We're, we've uh, made the system as safe as humanly possible. It's really time to just get on with things because this virus is going to be around for a while. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can help right now. You don't have to wait. Well, and, and, and just to pile on, arguably, as the testing data indicates, it's probably the safest place right now to be, yeah. to be at the hospital. Yeah, the grocery store is not that safe. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a question about uh, actually news sources, and there's just recognition that there's so many different places to get information on, on COVID-19 and particularly what's going on in San Diego. Um, do you all have any recommendations on, on where people turn for the most accurate info uh, as things move along? You know, you know I responded uh, electronically to that question. Um, I think oh. there's two places that we turn to a lot. Um, one is um, the county, San Diego County website. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, all of the hospital systems aggregate their data through that website. So you get a good detailed picture of the total incidence of cases throughout San Diego County, where they are, which hospitals, et cetera. Um, the other one that I turn to for, or for kind of more global information is the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID website. I think that's very good as well. Okay. And CDC. Right, uh, yes, yeah, obviously, yes, yeah, CDC. Okay. Um, and then I've got another question here with um, 
with lowered immune responses due to some cancer treatments. Have you all heard from patients that have fears or are struggling in life outside the clinic area um, in cases like just being able to get around and get supplies? And I know that's one thing that Potter's Pedal is thinking about is our mission is, is all about funding research, but we want to be here as a resource to support uh, the cancer community, whether it's potentially driving people to appointments or providing groceries is one thing we're looking at. So it looks like you guys are, have a couple of things to respond with. It's so important. So I look after people with blood cancers. And so their immune systems by definition are suppressed because they've got cancers of the immune system. And it's been very scary for them just to think about going out of the house um, you know, going to the grocery store feels like playing Russian roulette. And if I order something from the pharmacy, they think they might get something when they go to the pharmacy. So we're trying to ship medications to people's homes, uh, but they, they can't do that as readily for food. And I think it would make a huge difference if we could reach out to our um, patients who have compromised immune systems, um, who really are not keen to get out of the house to help them get groceries. Um, the other thing is getting rides that, you know, it's not an Uber and the hundred people haven't been in that car before, uh, that that uh, car is decontaminated and they feel safe coming here. I think it's, you know, when you get here, as Matthew and uh, Charlie were alluding to, it's fine. It's getting here. You know, that's the hard part for a lot of people. And so they've been stuck at home. And, you know, I was very concerned when a patient of mine came up through, came in through the ER right to the ICU because she was staying at home because she was too worried to come in in case she got COVID or was sent to a skilled nursing facility to further recover. Mm. She didn't want to get it there. And um, fortunately she got exceptional care in the ICU. And, you know, I saw her in clinic um, yesterday. She's doing a lot better, but I wish that she'd come in earlier, you know, so we need to get that message out that we can help to get people here. If uh, Padres Pedal can help to get people to our cancer center and our cancer services. Uh, we also have places around the county where they can get their lab work done. Um, we have drive through testing sites where they can be tested themselves for COVID-19. I, I think it's really, really important to get the message out that, you know, Padres Pedal is here to help in whatever way they need it, together with, uh, with us at the cancer center and UC San Diego Health. Yeah, and I would encourage uh, patients to, to not be shy, um, to, to look for help, to reach out for help in their neighborhoods and their families to, to wonderful groups like Padres Pedal the Cause or the American Cancer Society. Otherwise, to, to get that assistance, to, to not feel, you know, I'm, I'm from the South and my mom would never want to impose on anybody because, oh my goodness, that would just be awful. But the reality is, uh, this is the time to do it. And especially if you're going through, you know, cancer care, if, if you don't feel safe, you know, getting to the grocery store, Get, get some help, ask some, yeah, I, it, you'll be hard pressed to find anybody who would not be more than happy to jump in the car and grab their mask and, and go, you know, help you get what you need or what your family needs. So please, please, um, you know, get that help where you need it, wherever that may be. Great. Well, um, we are at 445 and I can see that actually attendance is still pretty well in this, but I'm going to start to wrap up. So if you do have any other burning questions, please type those in now. But I just wanted to hit on a few things and that um, from a Padres Pelo perspective, uh, we're listening and we really deeply appreciate how responsive you all are and not only making time for us today, but the care that you're giving to patients um, throughout your whole system. And we, you know, we made the decision to post to push our event from the fall this year to the spring. And so um, we have a deeply engaged community of people that want to help. And so we're thinking of ways that we can adapt and we hit on a few of those, but you know, we're probably not going to be able to do group training rides um, as we usually do in June, um, but we are committed to our World Without Cancer Day in, in the end of June, and we're going to celebrate and make a big impact on that. And, and this is just the first of, a, of hopefully a series of webinars where um, we'll get to highlight the amazing work that you all and some of our other partners are doing. And so um, a little teaser on that one, but um, Kat, you did give a big shout out to um, Dr. Ch Chadra at um, Stanford Burner Crevice. And so we want to do a follow-up series on this and just a look at basic science uh, from Salk and Sanford Burnham and how they're also adapting and, and um, doing research right now as well. So um, I'm going to pause and just see if I have any last questions here. Um, if any of the panelists have anything else that they want to share with the group, um, I welcome that. We're just really grateful to you, Anne, and Padres Pedal the Cause for everything you do year in, year out. It's so much fun to hold those gigantic checks 
together with our team and know that that's going to go to a very hopeful patient uh, who never thought they'd have a chance. And whether it's getting really specialized care with Dr. Coffey or one of our other brilliant um, clinical scientists, I think it's really uh, very extraordinary. Great. Well, um, thank you very much, Kat. And the, the last thing I want to do is just, uh, you, you have alluded to the, the biotech mecca that we live in, and I just want to thank a few of our partners who are doing some also pretty innovative things in the community, um, especially Thermo Fisher and ResMed and BD and many of these other community partners who are adapting um, just as we are and, and continuing to give our support, uh, give support to Padres Petal and in turn give support to cancer patients and cancer research. So, um, with that, um, Dr. Coffey, Dr. Jameson, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Um, to all of our panelists who dialed in, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we hope you had a great afternoon and we will send this around. So if you want to watch it again, you can or you can share with others. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you next time.